I remember that's him. There we go. Now let me put it on a picture. There we go. I'm giving y'all a different view of the uh, the Beat Navy Studio tonight. Very nice. Yeah, I'll try to show different angles mm. there so you can see all around. Wait, here we go. And it's Ken Kreitzer for Sons of the American Legion Radio. We are doing our Army football huddle. It's uh, week six for Army, and it is Wisconsin week. Uh, uh, a trip to Madison, Wisconsin on Saturday to play uh, the Badgers of the Big Ten uh, game that Army fans, coaches, players have looked forward to, had, had circled on the calendar for a long time. Another a series of visits to the Big Ten, Big 12, uh, that Army has conducted in recent years. So talk about that. We have Richard Miller from our SAL radio team in Florida. Good to see you, Richard. Hi, Ken. Ready, ready to put some Army football talk. Okay, way to go. And uh, from the Beat Navy studio in Huntsville, Alabama, we have Colonel Sam Houston from the West Point class of 87. Hey, Ken. It's uh... It's game face and gut check time of Army's football season. Okay, very good. Absolutely. We'll get to that. And from South Jersey, we have former Army football player Steve Shalou from the West Point class of 92. Steve, how are you tonight? Doing fantastic, Ken. It's game week. Absolutely. Now, I just want to start with something that uh, with the subject we've been talking, uh, and everyone in the Army is a passing of of uh, General Ray Odierno, the uh, former Army Chief of Staff, a West Point football player, uh, worked his way up in the ranks, leadership positions in, in many areas, including Iraq. Um, also an impact, uh, developed a major relationship with the NFL that uh, resulted in uh, building awareness for the need for uh, concussion awareness and uh, uh, treatment. And uh, I just wondered, uh, Steve or Sam, um, um, I know Sam uh, served with General Odierno, if you have any remembrances that you'd like to share. Yeah, we were talking before we started here. Um, I was mentioning the fact that uh, um, I met General Odierno on a couple of occasions and um, very fortunate to have been presented a coin by him on both occasions. Um, the first was back during the surge, back in uh, 2007. And at General Odierno was multinational corps Iraq commander. So he was a three-star then. And uh, I had a, a deployment support team with some Coast Guard personnel and, and uh, some army transporters. And we flew all over Iraq for over a year, helping out uh, brigade combat teams with deployment, redeployment issues and uh, really saw a lot of the operations that were going on that year and one of the places that we stopped in was uh, Bob TQ um, Al Takadam and a very dot desolate dry desert place out in western Iraq and we were assisting a uh, uh, an army infantry battalion that, that was uh, located there with the marines and lo and behold uh, uh, General Odierno and his entourage flew out there and uh, made a, a kind of a surprise visit and inspected the uh, infantry battalion, was there for their award ceremony. And afterward, he wanted to see what my team was doing. So we gave him a tour of the AO and a little bit of a quick
quick briefing of our operations and he gave all of us a coin. And uh, that was our first uh, real impression of the man. He really was a soldier's general. He cared about soldiers. Uh, he really deeply uh, took an interest in each and every person that he spoke with. And he was the right man at the right time during the surge as multinational corps commander. I then met him again in, in uh, 2013, uh, 2014 timeframe. Um, no, it was 2014, I take that back. Um, it was a 4th of July ceremony, uh, kind of a, they had a concert and some things going on in the C-130 hangar out at Bagram. And I was the Bagram garrison commander and, and General Odierno was now the Army Chief of Staff and he was there. And as I was telling Ken, um, whether he actually did remember me from 2007 or not uh, was irrelevant. He said that he did, and I believed him because he's a four-star general chief of staff and a, a guy that was could make about four of me because he was that big. <laughs> and uh, he presented me another coin, and, and we talked just briefly. And he gave me a, a, some really good, uh, just personal attaboy advice uh, to the, to, uh, for my position as garrison commander. Um, that was very critical uh, and, and very, there were words that I needed to hear from a guy like that at that, that precise moment in time. So it's, it's really unfortunate to hear of his passing. The, the Army really lost a larger than life character when they lost General Odierno. He was a warrior and a soldier's general. Yeah, just ask maybe, Steve, what is it like for the Army football brotherhood, the, uh, all of the alumni, when one of your former players uh, reaches the pinnacle of leadership in the U.S. Army Chief of Staff as as General Odierno uh, did. Well, there's a tremendous amount of pride um, to have somebody who played ball rise up, and and some of the guys that I played ball with right now are are one, two, and three star generals. It's a <clears throat> it's pretty exciting. Sometimes you scratch your head and like, how the heck did he make general? Um, and then sometimes it, uh, uh, I, you know, you, you look at it and say, wow, I mean, it, he's doing fantastic things. He, there's a sense of pride that you, you, you strapped on the helmet with them at the same time. I mean, General Ordiano, I'll tell you, um, we wouldn't be enjoying the level of success we're having today if it wasn't for his vision and his, you know, signing off and stamping uh, the, the current Munkin um, coaching staff and, and having him come in and do that. So, I mean, there's a lot to be thankful there, but that's small, that's small potatoes in comparisons to the lives that he, that he helped and saved in the real game of, of life. And that's, that's modern warfare. So I, I you know, he's, he was a, he was a great guy. He, uh, last time I saw him, he was walking through a lot up there at Mikey Stadium, and I asked him to come in to our tailgate, and you know where we tailgate, and to have a beer, and he came in and cracked open a cold one and, and hung out with the group, and uh, um, and that was that was great. He didn't want to make a big deal about it, he, you know, but but we, we got a kick out of just seeing him walk around, and we were all Army football brethren, and we wanted to, to, to have a, a cold drink with, with one of our brothers, whether he's a four-star general or a or, or spec four, it didn't matter. So um, just, it's a sad day when somebody goes so young and, uh, but, you know, uh, you know, duty ha have been done and, and, uh, and, and let it be said, well done. Uh, he is, uh, he's doing, uh, you know, he's, he's done his life's work and, and there are, there are thousands of people that are thankful for what he did. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I had the one chance to watch him uh, lead a meeting at uh, West Point uh, when he built a relationship with the NFL. He became very close, uh, uh, had a, a relationship with Roger Goodell, the NFL commissioner. <clears throat> the NFL was doing a lot of uh, troop support projects uh, and, uh, and uh, they held a summit at West Point in August of 2012 where both were both organizations committed to awareness, uh, building awareness of uh, identification of concussions, uh, treatment, and then also time to heal for both soldiers and for NFL players. And uh, that's a lasting contribution because the NFL 10 years ago uh, uh, was hesitant about it. And uh, 
I think uh, General Odierno added the vernacular of concussion protocol uh, to uh, culture, both football and to uh, to the Army. That was that's a lasting uh, contribution. Now this week, Army football goes out to Wisconsin, and of course, what does Wisconsin do? They play their best game of the year by far against Illinois, 24 to nothing, run for 391 yards, rush 391. I couldn't believe that. And we look at their defense and they're holding their opponents to an average of 41 yards rushing per game. And uh, they, 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 they've got uh, 31 tackles for loss. They've got 11 sacks on the season so far. And, uh, uh, I'd say the only thing that doesn't stand out is it doesn't look like their quarterback, Graham Mertz, is a, is a grade A passer. Uh, but he uh, can run and leading the offense. They got a, two running backs. We had a, Shea Malusi had 145 yards this week and Braylon Allen, 131 yards. So who would like to start on the challenge that Wisconsin's going to face? We're, I got to add, we were just looking at their offensive line statistics, and their smallest offensive lineman is 6'4", 305 uh, on their two-deep chart. And uh, as Coach Munko was saying today, they're, they are big. Uh, who would like to start on analyzing uh, uh, the Wisconsin Badgers? Go ahead, Steve. I, I mean, uh, wow, uh, you know, whether or not they are having a great year or not having a great year, um, it's still a, um, a Big Ten um, team who, uh, who lives and dies by running the football and they're road graders and they're going to be out there um, ready to go up against somebody who's going to be probably 20 to 30 pounds lighter than them. Um, and they're going to try to um, inflict their will on, on our defensive line. Uh, and we're going to attack that with slanting, and uh, we're going to attack that through uh, trying to, to, to cut off the angles and, and be at the right place at the right time uh, on, those, on those things. So it's going to be tough. Um, defensively, it'll be tough. Offensively, from our aspect, you know, I'd really love to have a couple of our players back. I'd love to have Connor Bishop back. I mean, he's – probably a game time decision at this point for him to play. Uh, he's making a go at it, I think this week uh, to put weight back on there and, and uh, try to be back by, by this, by this uh, Saturday. Uh, and I'd love to have um, Anderson back under center, but uh, I, I think that is probably a couple of weeks premature on that. So how do we, how do we approach it? Who's going to be under center? Uh, are we going to put, put some different uh, looks and, different opportunities and angles and maybe trapping and doing some other things to keep them off balance to uh, the things we talked about the last time we were on the call. But again, this is going to be one of those monumental efforts like against Oklahoma, like against Ohio state, like against uh, Michigan. When we played them, we usually rise up. So we have that in our favor. Uh, we rise up and play to the level of our opponents. And, and, and I know that they'll know that there's somebody out, they're playing against them and playing against them hard from the first snap to the very last snap. Uh, how does it end up? I, I, I don't know, but we'll represent ourselves and we'll play hard. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I, I, I hope a couple of breaks go our way and we can pull one up, pull one off. Okay. Uh, Sam Houston, what, what's your thought about uh, the Wisconsin Badgers are two and three on the year. Uh, they beat Eastern Michigan handily, and uh, and they beat Illinois, but they lost to Penn State, sixteen to ten, Notre Dame forty one thirteen, and Michigan thirty eight seventeen. So, which is the real team, the one that blew out Illinois, or the one that lost uh, to Notre Dame and Michigan? Couldn't stay, couldn't stay with them. First. Uh... I want to make sure everyone listening knows I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer here. I'm just trying to be a Ronnie realist. And the realist uh, in me is seeing Wisconsin for what Wisconsin always is. Just like Steve said, they are a big corn fed beef Midwestern team that lives by running the football. I mean, the likes of Ron Dane came out of Wisconsin and uh, it will 
be the biggest team that Army faces this entire season. And Steve is correct that Army has faced teams and played them well under similar circumstances, i.e. Oklahoma and Michigan. One of the most important keys to the defensive strategy of the game is gonna be offensive time of possession. And if you look at the Oklahoma and the Michigan games, the reason the defense was able to stay fresh and uh, face down these behemoths on the offensive lines of these respective teams is because the Army offense managed to overwhelmingly win the time of possession battle and keep the ball out of the hands of the opposing offense. Um, if you look back at the Oklahoma game, Army held the ball for 45 minutes. And Kyler Murray, Heisman Trophy winner, had his worst game of the season because he never had the ball. Mm. When he did have the ball, he made something happen, but he never had the ball. I thought, I thought that game, Kyler Murray started doing crossword puzzles on the bench. <laughs> he was on the bench. He, did, he couldn't, right. couldn't get him on the field. He <laughs> had plenty of time to do that, definitely. But here's the Ronnie realist in me right now. When you look at those two games, though, you had a, a true uh, starting quarterback for Army that was very effective in running the triple option football named Kelvin Hopkins. Sure. This time, who do we have? We're not and sure. I'm going to tell you. Let's look at the optimistic side of the coin on offense, and let's look at the pessimistic side of the coin on offense. What Wisconsin's defense has not faced this entire year is a backfield that has not one, not two, but three 260 pound fullbacks. Two of whom are extremely athletic and one of whom is just an absolute human wrecking ball. Now, how much do they get used? Because if you're not wearing out that defensive line, that corn fed fed beef defensive line, that's gonna be bigger than the army offensive line and making them put their hands on the hips and pant for air and continue to pound them and grind them down, uh, they're going to control the line of scrimmage. And what is not going to work either to win the game or to win the time of possession battle with Wisconsin this Saturday is going to be be back up the middle, tire Tyler right, tire Tyler left. Because what it'll be is be back up the middle, tire Tyler left, Tyler, Tyler, right, punt. And we'll go three and out all first half. And eventually that gigantic behemoth offensive line on Wisconsin's offense is going to start to get their will uh, against the Army defense who is going to get worn out. So uh, this is a real X factor for this Saturday. And I want to be optimistic about the game, but quarterback play is so important. And, and right now, um, I'm just having my misgivings about what Army's offense is going to be able to do this coming Saturday. And quite frankly, if Army's offense cannot get the job done, uh, this game is a no-brainer. Well, we spoke to Coach Munkin uh, at his Monday press conference, and I asked him about the quarterback situation, and he did not really offer any news. Uh, on Christian Anderson, uh, Steve uh, mentioned that he believes he's not ready yet for uh, this game. Um, so I, he didn't give a clarification if Tyree Tyler is back ready. He took a bad hit in the Ball State game, as did Jamel Jones. And I, I'm my suspicion is that Jabari Laws could be coming in off the bench as a number two for the game if Tyree Tyler gets hurt or is ineffective. Uh, that we could see Jabari Laws uh, would be kind of a natural for him to uh, to go in um, off the bench and see what he what he has got, you know what what is what he has of what he showed as when he was a sophomore. I I still have that vision of get, about the great drive he he ran at Air Force as a sophomore and what he has left. Um, you know, Sam, you're right about that defensive line for uh, Wisconsin there. Nose tackle 
is Keener uh, Benton, 6'4", 3'17", two defensive ends that are 6'3", 6'4", 291, 297, uh, Henningsen and Benton. Um, Coach Munkin also mentioned the, the big linebacker they have, number five, Leo Chanel, who's 6'2", 261. And Coach was saying that these, this linebacker being over 250 pounds is, is a big edge uh, for them. Um, so they, Wisconsin's got the size, but um, the question is, uh, do they have the quarterback play? Um, Army could shut down there too. The question is, if, can Army do a better job of defending the run than Illinois did? Illinois couldn't stop Wisconsin run for all day. Gave up 390 yards. Army's run defense, I got to think, is going to do a significantly better job than Illinois did and could keep Army in the game. So we'll, we'll see. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's give Richard Miller a chance. <clears throat> and welcome to Jack who uh, joined us. Uh, and uh, we'll tell us a little bit about Navy and Air Force in a moment. But Richard, why don't you go through and we'll talk about some of the extraordinary top 25 games this past week. Yes, number, <clears throat> number 17, Ole, Ole Miss, who's a 4-1 and one on the season, 52-51 over Arkansas. Arkansas is now 4-2 and two on the season, a very high scoring game there. Number seven, Ohio State, five and one now, 66 to 17 over Maryland. Maryland is four and two on the season. Number 11, Michigan State, six no on the season, 31 13 victory over Rutgers. Number six, Oklahoma, and number 21, Texas. Oklahoma is now six no, 55 48 over Texas, a very high scoring game in the Red River Wild. Big win for number Oklahoma. Yeah. What do you guys think about um, Oklahoma's win over Texas? Good Lord. Oh, man. Nobody played defense in that game. Eh, no one no one plays defense. Practically inexcusable for Texas to have that big of a lead in a game. And, and even that big of a lead at halftime in the Red River rivalry and then implode the way they did simply because Oklahoma changed quarterbacks. Um, I mean, it just was uh, a heartbreaker for the Longhorns. I mean... Better luck next year. Okay, Richard, go ahead. Okay. Um, number 20, Florida defeats Vanderbilt 42 to nothing. Florida's four and two on the season. Vanderbilt is two and four on the season. Number 10, Boise State suffers their first loss, going to five and one now. B BYU, I mean, number 10, BYU goes to five and one. They lose 26 to 17 to Boise State. Boise State is now three and three on the season. Navy drops to one and four is number 24. SMU goes to six, no, a 31 24 victory. Number two, Georgia still stays in that ranking. They may move up to number one. Georgia, a 34 to 10 victory over number 18, Auburn. Auburn is four and two on the season. In overtime, number 19, Wake Forest, 40 to, 40 to 37 over Syracuse. Syracuse is three and three, and three on the season. Wake Forest is six and no. Number three, Iowa. Sure, let's, let, let's talk about Wake Forest for a second. Uh, they struggled with Syracuse uh, on the road. They will be in Mikey Stadium in uh, in a, uh, next week after Army's game against Wisconsin. What do you guys think about Wake Forest? Are they for real? Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I think so. Oh, and oh, and oh, by the way, they have a bye week before Army. That that's what concerns me the most so people are going to look to the Syracuse game <laughs> and I know my dad and I watched that game and because uh, I was uh, up in North Carolina um, to visit my parents this past weekend and a lot of people are going to look to the fact that Syracuse uh, had a pretty easy time running the football they really did and uh, they seemed at times to be moving the ball at will on Wake Forest but uh, as Steve mentioned um, you can't look at that one game and say, oh, look, look how porous Wake Forest defense is against the run. Hey, they got two weeks to work on Army triple option football. And uh, Army triple option football, if it is as one-dimensional as it was against Ball State, 
It isn't going to take long for Wake Forest to figure that out. They have an extremely explosive offense, as they proved against Syracuse, and um, they will be they'll be ready uh, in Mikey Stadium. Don't worry about it. They'll be ready. Okay, Richard, go ahead. <clears throat> on the <clears throat> on on the on the score front, let's see. Um, LSU and Kentucky. Kentucky 42-21. Kentucky 42-21 over LSU. Kentucky number 16 in the country is now 6 no. LSU is 3-3 three and three on the season. Um, also, number 9 Michigan improves a 6 no. 32-29 over Nebraska. Nebraska is 3-0. No. Michigan goes to 6-0 six, six no on, this, on the season. Number 14 Notre Dame goes 5-1 and one on the season, defeating Virginia Tech 32 to 29. Notre Dame is five and one on the season. Virginia Tech is three and two. Number one, Alabama loses to Texas A&M 41 to 38. Alabama's first loss of, of the season, while Texas A&M goes to four and two on the season. Number 25, San Diego State improves to five and zero oh, while defeating New Mexico 31 to seven. San Diego State now five and five and zero oh on the season. Number five, Cincinnati is five and zero on the season, defeating Temple fifty-two to three. Temple is three and three on the season. Number twenty-two, Arizona State five and one on the season, win twenty-eight to ten over Stanford. Stanford goes to three and three on the season. Coastal Carolina is six and zero, fifty-two to twenty fifty, sixty-two uh, fifty-two to twenty fifty over Arkansas State. Arkansas State is now five and one on the season, while Coastal Carolina is picked up their sixth consecutive victory. Okay, okay, very good, Richard. Uh, it's interesting that you're going to have some power uh, group of five teams such as uh, Cincinnati, San Diego State, Coastal Carolina undefeated, and uh, perhaps one of those teams, especially Cincinnati, getting through the season and trying to make a case to themselves to get into the college football playoff. I think San Diego State's sort of an interesting uh, team. Um, you know, do they want to stay in the, in the Mountain West Conference? Or, you know, are they, are they really pushing to try and get into the Pac-12 or even, uh, you know, if the Big 12 were to expand? Uh, so uh, we watching that. Um, the question I have for you guys about Wisconsin's running game is how does it compare or how is it different from Army running the ball? Um, Wisconsin's depending on big fullbacks and, uh, and a big offensive line. How is that different from how Army runs the ball, would you say? Well, and Steve can add on to this. You know, Wisconsin does not run a triple option offense. So their running plays, they're almost exclusively design running plays for the back who gets the ball. So in many cases, they don't involve a read. There is a, uh, there is a, a hole or a uh, blocking scheme that uh, creates the, the seam or the hole that the back who is intended to get the ball is going to be aiming for. And uh, the only real read is for the back to read his block. And then once downfield reads his blocks. Um, whereas, uh, you know, Army's offense, um, by definition, is a triple option, though sometimes we pull our hair out about it not actually being run like a triple option. The quarterback is who is making a read based on the reaction of the defense. And uh, the reactions of the defense can lead to, uh, in the sense of triple option, is that either the B back gets the ball or the quarterback tucks and uh, reads again, the second read. Uh, and, and then the two next options are based on the second read is either he tucks the ball and runs or he pitches the ball to the outside. And uh, uh, while Wisconsin may run a couple of maybe a double option play where the quarterback runs the, the midline and, and does a read on the defensive end and pitches it to the outside, uh, most of the most of the plays that they run are, are they are single option plays specifically designed for the running back who's getting the ball. And uh, I'll let Steve correct me now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get off mute here. Uh, you know, <clears throat> the, 
the triple option is going to use uh, uh, numbers. It's really a numbers game. You're going to have a, an odd side and an even side, and and we're we're running to the side at which we're going to have the uh, the, the advantage in terms of numbers, and and we're going to eliminate one of the players, at the, usually the pitch key, to put him on an island and make him commit, and then we're going to get the ball outside that way. So we're using, it's really a numbers game. So when you come up to the line of scrimmage with 11 players, you've got to choose one side's going to have five, one side's going to have six. So generally you're trying to set your, your, your formations to get to the five side and then further eliminate one of those players by, you know, going and leaving them unblocked. I mean, we leave the defensive tackle unblocked for the fullback as a read, and then we leave the defensive end untackled or unblocked. It's going to be a pitch key. I mean, if everybody else is blocking who they need to go, it's it's clear sailing. So, you know, difference with with a team like Wisconsin, the road grader type thing. A lot of them are using a zone blocking scheme where they're using angles and they're everybody's scooping one direction, and you're trying to create a seam. And a lot of the times, the running backs breaking it backside because if you're cutting off that backside pursuit, you're going to have that seam. And and you know the uh, the the zone blocking scheme was created. Um, you know, really, uh, the Denver Broncos started that out when they went in the Super Bowl runs with with uh, John Elway and and Alex Gibbs was the uh, he was the orchestrator of, of a lot of that and he taught most of these teams to include in and and I think Wisconsin uh, and he passed away recently and his his son was my teammate and uh, God bless Alex Gibbs he was a hell of a man but um, you know so it, it's a it's different because they're not relying upon angles and numbers they're relying upon angles and uh, lanes that they're creating and when you're you know 310 320 pounds you can create those angles and lanes just by your 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 your, your sheer mass so it's different that way absolutely thank you now one thing i look at is um the uh wisconsin quarterback graham mertz um uh, uh his five games so far uh he's got a 56 percent completion average and uh, been throwing for 156 yards a game. But what stands out and the reason perhaps why uh, Wisconsin has struggled in some of those games is seven interceptions. And that's a lot for, um, you know, uh, seven interceptions and two touchdown passes. Now, they obviously may switch to the running game when they get into the red zone. Um, uh, but that is – that – that doesn't sound like some of the quarterbacks we've seen, you know, like the Ball State quarterback or the player, the quarterback from Western Kentucky who could really throw the ball. Uh, sounds like he is uh, – they are, they are really depending on their uh, rushing game. Well, they, they always do. I mean, Wisconsin historically is a power rushing team, and uh, – the quarterback is more of a game manager for them. Um, so passing is secondary to running the football. So uh, they're not so reliant upon the passing attack. They're not a team that is going to hit the field like Western Kentucky with three and four wideouts on every play and uh, multiple people downfield in, in uh, uh, patterns. Um, where they're looking for the hole in the, the zone or the one-on-one -on -one coverage that gets beaten um, because they've got the ball uh, and the quarterback's primary responsibility with that football is to hand it off or pitch it. So um, that's the big, big reason. I'm, I'm not that uh, really concerned about um, – Wisconsin's passing attack as I am about what they do in power running the football and coupled to that will Army be able to win the time of possession because if they can't that power rushing attack by Wisconsin and those gigantic road graders as Steve called them that they have on their offensive line will take a toll on our defense by the second half yeah well that, that could be I mean uh, they're Top uh, running back is Shea Maluzzi, who is a junior from Naples, Florida. Only 5'11", 204. Uh, he's in the not kind of body size of uh, Tyrell Robinson. But he's got, uh, 
you know, he's averaging five yards a carry. He's got three touchdowns. Uh, he's gained 494, averaging 95 a game. And uh, Wisconsin has eight rushing touchdowns. Their opponents only two. Uh, their opponents have really struggled to run the ball against uh, their defense. What is our, I mean, are they all looking at what Ball State did to Army in the second half? Shutting down Army's offense uh, uh, pretty effectively. Is that going to be what what Wisconsin, uh, the film Wisconsin is going to be focused on? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. And, and, and Ken, I don't, I don't want to correct you, but Tyrell Robinson hadn't seen 5'11 uh, with platform shoes on. So I don't, I don't know where we're, where, uh, he's, uh, he's not, he's not. Uh, quite... I don't, they don't let me talk to him anymore. So That's I'm, right. Uh, up close. Uh, but uh, he's not that, but he's, uh, you know, so it's not the size of a, of a running back that you'd expect at Wisconsin, but he's apparently a very fast, uh, effective player. Yeah, you know they're going to um, I, I, they're they're going to scour. I mean, this is this is what they do. They're scouring film. They're going to see what worked. They're going to see. Uh, they're going to pack the box. They're going to challenge us to throw the ball. They're going to challenge us to do it, and they're going to take away. They're going to take away the fullback. Then they'll take away the quarterback, and they're going to want us to beat them outside. That's how I would do it. I would put I would put a nose tackle. And two, three techniques on the guards, on the outside shoulder of the guards, and I would with two defensive ends, and I'd run it like that all day long. And if I was running defense against them, because they're you're going to stuff the you're going to stuff the front side of the or the center. You can't double team anywhere, and you're not going to get enough push to get that fullback any any movement. And then if you're pulling from the fullback, you're not going to get to the end. So they're going to challenge us to go outside. Uh, so they're going to, I would say, I would stack the inside against us. Uh, uh, and they're watching, they're watching film. Um, they're, they're leaving no stone unturned for sure. Okay. Well, yeah. this is the group that said the key to Army's victories is to get the ball 12 times to the slot backs. You got to get it outside. Um, I mean, yeah. yeah. On the pitch. And yep. can I, pitch I'd say up to your question about game film, I, I would think that, uh, the game film of Army's offense that Wisconsin's probably watching the most is Georgia State and UConn. And the reason I say those two games is because they see a much greater variety of the Army offensive game plan and plays being executed. If they're looking strictly at the Ball State game, uh, they're going to miss out on the whole gamut of plays that Army can run because Army really ran such a utterly – dismal one-dimensional game um, in the Ball State game that it, it's hard to really build a defense strategy off of just looking at, at that particular game. Army's offense made it easy for Ball State to defend them. And uh, we hope and we pray that Army's offense does not make it easy for Wisconsin to defend them this coming Saturday. Okay. Let's uh, let's uh, say hello to Jack McGurk, who uh, was able to join us. And Jack, good Hi. to see you. Good to see you. And uh, why don't you, uh, you take us through uh, the win by Air Force and the loss by Navy? All righty, I'll start with Air Force improving to five and one with a 24-14 win at home over Wyoming. Uh, Air Force had 321 yards total offense, 211 rushing. Uh, eight different players combined for that 211 yards rushing. Um, leading that was Brad Roberts, uh, who rushed for 140 yards on a career high 33 carries, including one yard touchdown carry for the first score of the game. Uh, Hazik Daniels, a quarterback, rushed for 23 yards, but he actually threw for 110, including a 13 yard touchdown pass to Mika Davis in the third quarter. Uh, Dane Kinman had a two yard touchdown run in the second quarter, giving the Falcons a 14 0 lead. But uh, Wyoming scored two touchdowns in two minutes, 24 seconds uh, late in the second quarter, tied the score at halftime, 14-14. Uh, Air Force took a 21-14 lead after that touchdown pass to Mika Davis uh, with 5.46 left in the third quarter. Anthony Rodriguez kicked a 26-yard uh, field goal for the Falcons in the fourth quarter, giving them a 24-14 lead. Wyoming got the ball back with 2.42 left in the game, but were shut down by the Falcons' defense. Um, and Trey Taylor 
uh, led the Falcons with seven tackles. Corbin uh, Taylor and Vince Sanford had six tackles each. Sanford also had a sack and two forced and recovered fumbles in the game. In this game for him and Air Force is there now five and one and uh, two and one in the Mountain West Conference. And this weekend they have another conference game uh, on the road at Boise State. So that should be an interesting one. That should be quite a test for Air Force. Uh, Sam Houston, what's your weekly analysis of, uh, of the Air Force team? Air Force is, uh, I thought about Air Force a little bit um, before the huddle started. And the first thing I wanted to say about Air Force, and it's very helpful for Army, hopefully to uh, pay attention to this. Um, last week, I think it was Steve Shalhoub was talking about, there's different ways to run the B-back than just a straight B-back dive. And Air Force right now, if you watch their offense, they're holding a B-back clinic. If you will watch what they do, they run the B-back on the straight dive. They run the B-back on a counterplay. They run the B-back on a veer. They run the B-back on sweeps. And the reason that Brad Roberts is able to have so much success is because when the B-back, when he's playing B-back, every single time he gets the ball, it's not the same play to the left or right of center. The blocking schemes are different. The hole's different. The uh, design of the play is different. And then on top of that, it makes the rest of their offense work. Um, you listen to what Jack said. Eight different players touch the ball. And uh, that means that the triple option is being run correctly. Uh, here's another clue. Ezekiel Daniels did not carry the ball the preponderance of the plays. As a matter of fact, he carried it the fewest. He distributed the ball because he is a triple option ball manager. And like I said last week, I think Hazeek Daniels of all the all the service academy quarterbacks right now, he's the best one. He's big. He understands the reads. And by the way, when he has to, he also throws the ball well. Um, he had a stretch in the second half of the game on, the, on their touchdown drive in the third quarter where he completed four or five straight passes, including the pass that scored the touchdown. So Air Force is a real legitimate threat. Now, on top of that, uh, Wyoming did make them look a little bit more mortal. Um, Wyoming did at times stifle Air Force's offense uh, through the second quarter um, and through a, a great stretch of the second half, uh, Air Force's offense was pretty stifled by Wyoming. Once they recovered from some of their initial mistakes that they made, and uh, made some adjustments. So they did show a glimmer of hope on how to stop Air Force, and they did hold down their offensive scoring to a, uh, a more uh, manageable 24 points. But just as I predicted, Air Force won the game. Um, my one zinger against Air Force, because I, I always uh, have to make sure that I throw in a zinger, and uh, that is uh, the announcers I think this is the third straight or the third Air Force game this season that I've watched where the announcers couldn't help themselves but to bring up the turnbacks. And they did it again. And if you remember back at the beginning of the season, we were talking about how good is Air Force going to be. I said the X factor is the turnbacks. They get 31 players back. Almost all of them were def defensive players. Well, guess what? The defense that Air Force is running this season is comprised almost entirely of people who were turnbacks last year. So they got a season to sit around and do nothing but lift weights and, and gain weight and, uh, and prepare. So they had a whole season off to prepare and get healthy and then get back on the field, which is what they, they feel it is a, a, def, a defense of turnbacks. And uh, they're playing very well. I mean, I hate to say it, they got away with it. They're playing very well. It's not the same defense. They play the same type of defense, but it's not the same players that Army played last season, and they're playing very well. So okay. Air Force, again, aside from Wake Forest, is the team that concerns me the most uh, in the coming three games that Army has to play. Yeah, it's quite a stretch for Army, but we'll see how Air Force does when they go up to play at Boise State. That, that will be a, a test for them. Jack, tell us about the Naval Academy's game, if you would. Okay, uh, Navy fell to 1-4 after a 31-24 loss to SMU. It was a close game. 
Uh, Navy had 241 yards total offense, 64 passing, 177 rushing. Chance Warren had a 23-yard touchdown run late in the first quarter, tying the score at 7-7 after SMU quarterback Tanner Mordecai threw a 66-yard touchdown pass earlier in the quarter. Uh, near the beginning of the second quarter, Navy quarterback Ty Lavatai threw a 37-yard touchdown pass to the sophomore slot back Kai Pueloa Rojas, giving Navy a 14-7 lead. Uh, Lavatai also led the team with 53 yards rushing. Then uh, there were a couple of big turnovers that went to Navy's way. Uh, Tanner Mordecai was intercepted in the end zone by uh, Navy junior linebacker Johnny Hodges. And later in the second quarter, he fumbled and Diego Fago uh, recovered it and returned and ran it 20 yards back for a touchdown, giving Navy a 21 to 7 lead. Uh, the SMU was able to tie the game 21 to 21 at halftime after a 95 yard kickoff return by Brian Massey and later a two yard touchdown run by uh, Trey Siggers with 154 left in the half. Blake Mazza kicked a 37 yard field goal, giving SMU a 24 21 lead with 726 left in the third quarter. But Navy responded uh, with a 50 yard field goal kick by Bijan Nichols, tying the score uh, at the end of the quarter. Uh, Tanner Mordecai threw a 22 yard touchdown pass to Jordan Curley with 819 left in the game, giving SMU a 31 24 lead. Navy got the ball back, but turned the ball over on downs twice. The second time was uh, inside their own 20. Now, on defense, I mentioned uh, Johnny Hodges, the linebacker, had that interception in the end zone for Navy. He led the midshipmen with 14 tackles in the game. Kevin Brenneman and Diego Fago had uh, seven tackles each. And uh, midshipmen, unfortunately, they're one and four after this uh, tough loss for them. And they actually have a game this Thursday night at Memphis. Uh, it's the first time since 2004 that Navy has had to play on a Thursday night after playing on Saturday. So uh, a short week for Navy. Yeah, and they got to travel, uh, which makes it even more difficult. Uh, uh, SMU proving to be a good team. And uh, so we will uh, see what that game is on, on Thursday night at uh, Memphis. Okay, we're getting set. Now, I'm going to actually make the trip out to Wisconsin to uh, cover the game. We're going to try to go to the uh, – Association of Graduates. I guess the Society uh, for Wisconsin is going to have a tailgate before the game. We're also going to uh, get uh, do video of the uh, marching band from Wisconsin and their halftime, and uh, should be a good uh, a good trip um, to uh, see one of the capitals, you might say, of of college football. Um, have, did any of you go to any of the other visits? Uh, Army's been on a string where they've played at Penn State, Ohio State, Oklahoma, and then Michigan. And what an environment uh, those games have been. Steve Shalou, tell us which game did you get to? All, all of the above. Okay. I went, I, went to, I went to Penn State. I went to um, Ohio State. I went to Oklahoma. And I went to Michigan. So, um Interesting, uh, definitely. Um, <clears throat> loved Penn State fans. Loved, loved, loved Oklahoma fans. You can keep Michigan fans. <laughs> and Ohio State was right there with Michigan. So um, wasn't a big fan of, of Ohio State and uh, Michigan. And they were not, they were not very, they were not very nice. I will, I will say that. So, um, but did get the opportunity to, to, to go to those games. Well, I know the uh, Oklahoma marching band spelled Army on the field. So did Ohio State. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing that was really neat was when we were out at, at Oklahoma, the, uh, the Oklahoma uh, ROTC department was recognized for their 100th anniversary. And they did a parade of, of alumni of their ROTC department across the field uh, at halftime. And it was, it was kind of neat to see. Um, I still will never forget at Oklahoma, Steve, when the sound the crowd made, when it, it got down to that uh, fourth down play or third down play, when Army had the ball at uh, the Oklahoma 25 yard line, third down and uh, uh, trailing, I guess, uh, by a couple of points and uh, the sound they made, uh, I, I'll never forget. I was standing behind the end zone, and uh, 
Uh, it sounded to me like the sound they, they usually just reserve for uh, Texas. What, what, was that, what was that moment like for you? Well, the interesting thing, I, I will tell you, uh, I will tell you that the, I went to an event Friday night before the Saturday game, and it was a, a combination between the Army uh, Athletic Department and the Oklahoma Athletic Department, and we did it in their, I think it was Barry Schwitzer Hall, and I was there, you know, having a couple of beers with Bob Stoops, and we were talking, we were talking about, and they were just so nice and cordial, but, you know, we turned to them and said, we're coming at you tomorrow, we're going to beat you. And they, they laughed and like chuckled and the whole thing. And, and there was a little bit of an open mic between uh, the athletic the athletic director and their athletic director. And our soup was talking to their uh, president. And, and we were all, you know, like, guys, tomorrow we're coming at you. And, and they all chuckled and, you know, you guys are great and everything's so nice and cordial. But about the third quarter, they knew they knew they were in for the rest of rest of a dogfight, and uh, it was different. It was, and, and, and the people in the, the stands were, they got quieter and quieter. It was an interesting feel. Uh, it was a great experience. It never felt, you know, I felt actually physically threatened when I was in uh, in Michigan Stadium when we were going down to drive and going in overtime. They're throwing stuff at us and and doing other things, and uh, that was interesting because it's not easy to get out of that stadium. Uh, because it's a it's a bowl, but uh, uh, it was it was a very interesting. But uh, I, I mean, I love that experience. I unfortunately can't get out to Wisconsin. Uh, you know, we've got uh, uh, some family stuff here that I have to take care of. But uh, somebody's ill, and and I'm going to stay here local. But I'd love to get out there and see that experience too. Well, yeah. it should be. Interesting. Yeah, no. I don't think Army. I don't think Army's going to uh, going to. Uh, um, I think I think Wisconsin's going to take Army seriously. I think. Uh, they're going to show them all the Oklahoma game film. Yeah, and, and, game film. I, I wasn't at the Oklahoma game. I was one of the one of the guys you had to pay sixty dollars to watch the Sooner Vision version of the game. But uh, to talk about just for a moment a learning lesson point for this coming weekend that I hope Army has taken into account. The play that you're talking about for those who are unfamiliar with the game is uh, in the fourth, Army had stopped Oklahoma on a goal line stand, took over the ball, and proceeded to drive a long time consuming drive. And it was beginning to look like Army was going to run the clock out and score uh, with no practically no time left on the clock. And Army was going to win the game because the score at the time was tied 21 all. That's right. And, you remember the score. And the Army uh, drove running. Basically, uh, they had Oklahoma's defense absolutely worn out. I mean, the defensive linemen had their hands on their hips. They were getting pounded by Army's offensive line. It was the time for the triple option to thrive, and it was. And Army was grinding out uh, between the tackle plays that were gaining five and six yards of pop. And they had first and 10 down inside the 30 Oklahoma 30 yard line with just over three minutes to go in the game. And you knew that Army was going to keep that drive going and punch it in with less than a minute to go in the game. But then what happened? On first and second down, Army got cute on play calling and got behind schedule big time. So that on third down, the play that Ken is uh, talking about, uh, they were forced to pass behind schedule and the pass was intercepted and it ended the drive. Um, Oklahoma did drive down the field and try a game winning field goal that they missed and it went into overtime and we know the result. But the point is when it's working between the tackles guys and you've got them on their heels and you're wearing them out, don't get cute. Keep doing what works. Like my dad says, you keep doing what works until they stop you. Then try something else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I would, you know, I would have loved to have seen Army just do a run right to get right into the middle of the field on that third down play and, and give their kicker a chance um, at a field goal to uh, to uh, give Army a lead. I don't think they had a lot of confidence in their field goal kicker at that point. No, and Army's field goal better. kicking was atrocious that year. But they're much, they, you know, Cole Talley's a much better, you know, he's a very consistent player and kicker um 
I just that wish they had season. a chance for that field goal. Yeah, that was the season where they ended up bringing up the kicker from the sprint team. Abercrombie. Yeah, Abercrombie, yes. And he turned out to be really good. Um, he, did, he did miss a field goal in the Navy game, but I think that was the only miss that he had. Um, so he, he actually kind of single-handedly rescued the uh, place kicking for Army that season. But he came up after the Oklahoma game. Okay, well, I hope they continued this series. The Tennessee game, as we discussed, uh, was canceled, which was going to be the destination next year. Um, and uh, we'll see what – and they've got a game, what is it, LSU the year after uh, coming up. And I, I – Yes, see what, At, what else? in Baton Rouge. I'm sorry? In Baton Rouge. In Baton Rouge. Stadium. That will be quite a, quite a night. Okay, well, let's get uh, down to our lightning round of, um, of what your prediction is, uh, keys to the game. Army at Wisconsin, a uh, 7 o'clock Eastern time start. Uh, let's, let's, give, um, Jack, uh, let's give Jack McGurk the uh, opening uh, uh, prediction. Okay, well... Um... Wisconsin's are actually 12 and a half point favorites in this game, which seems a little bit high, but um, I think Army is going to play really hard in this game. If you look back at some of those uh, big games you're just talking about, like Oklahoma and uh, Michigan, both of those games ended in overtime. They were pretty close. And uh, this is going to be another close one, too. Army is going to be playing hard. They're also going to be uh, playing uh, with heavy hearts, as we just found out over the weekend that uh, former Army football player, uh, General Ray Odierno sadly passed away at the age of 67. Um, but I think this game is going to be close. I'm going to say 24-21 uh, Wisconsin, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Jack's down. We're going to, we're going to write that down. Uh, uh, Jack's got uh, Wisconsin 24-21. Okay. Richard Miller, you're next. <clears throat> I have. I also have Wisconsin in, in overtime, but by, by a field goal, 20, 29, 26. Wow, twenty nine, twenty six for Wisconsin in, in overtime. In overtime, okay. Yeah, so that's going to be an inter That would be an interesting uh, uh, scenario. Okay, now who who would like to go uh, next, uh, Sam or Steve? Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> um, this week, I'm going to abstain. <laughs> I can't, I can't was, do it. I that was a, it. Oh my. That was a graceful, was, oh, graceful hunt right so there. Easy. Army okay. 25, Wisconsin 24. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah. um, okay, 25, 24, Army wins a close one, one point. Yeah. Okay. Um, my disclaimer on, on my prediction is uh, I hope that no one out there doubts my, um, my black and gold and gray blood that curses through my veins and, uh, and sustains my every being of, of, of a beat Navy, beat Air Force, go Army football, and my, the walls of my beat Navy studio bear testament to this. But for the sake of our huddle, I have got to put the old Ronnie Realist hat back on here and uh, pull myself away from any bias I may have for the game. Yes, I want Army to win. Yes, I will be cheering my everlasting Go Army uh, rocket cheer hard out for Army to win. However, um, I'm, I'm not feeling it, guys. I'm not feeling it at all. And quarterback play is central to this. That was the point I was making at the very beginning. If Tyre Tyler starts the game, and again, I'm not criticizing Tyre Tyler for his heart, for his determination, for his grit, um, for his athleticism, for his commitment to the team, any of the above. Um, he's a great athlete, but a quarterback uh, running our triple option, he's not. He's also the smallest player on the team and he has a propensity to carry the ball as opposed to actually run the triple option. And I do not like a 175 pound player running left and right against 300 pound defensive linemen and a stone cold killers and linebacker who weigh 
almost twice as much as he did. Um, that being said, I think the defense is going to come out ready to play and they're going to play hard, but Army's offense is not going to win the time of possession game running a one dimensional offense. And after a number of three and outs, it's inevitable that Wisconsin is going to score. And so at halftime, I think it's going to be 21-0 Wisconsin. And uh, at the end of the game, uh, Army will finally break the goal line. But at the end of the game, we're going to be looking at 28-7 final score. 7 for Sam. Yeah. Wisconsin. And this is, for the record, this is the first time in a huddle that we've done that I have ever not picked Army. But I just can't do it this time, guys. I just can't do it. Mm, okay. Okay. Well, I guess uh, my thought is uh, the Army defense is going to uh, uh, be, I think, well set up to stop Wisconsin's passing game. Wisconsin's going to try to run like they did against Illinois, and that's going to be the challenge. Uh, watch for Eric Smith, a linebacker, to have a big game. And uh, – and we'll see what, uh, you know, I think that's going to be one of the, the key matchups is how the Army linebackers, uh, uh, Andre Carter and, and Eric Smith, can handle the uh, Wisconsin offensive line, the blocks that they're going to see, and also uh, the running game. On offense, there is a big question mark uh, at who's going to play quarterback. I think it's uh, when you're going into a big game, you're not sure who your quarterback is going to be. That's a a problem in and of itself. Uh, Army should be effective. The question is, are they going to be the offense that played well, ran two scoring drives in the second quarter against Ball State, or the offense that had uh, four or five straight uh, uh, unproductive drives in uh, the third quarter going into the fourth? Uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I think Tyree Tyler is going to start. I think he could be effective. But I have this suspicion it could be the first time, first game that we see Jabari Laws play significantly. I wouldn't be surprised if he's the next quarterback uh, to go in the game if Tyree gets hurt or if he uh, is ineffective. I think it would be the right place to give Jabari Laws a chance to show what he can do if he's if he can if he's close to the quarterback that had the outstanding sophomore year two years ago uh, for Army. I'm going to say Army's going to give this one a tough fight, and uh, I'm going to go for 24-21 that they're going to pull an upset. Um, and uh, and I think it could be – really just depends. Army's got to stop the Wisconsin uh, rushing game, and they've got to run the, the offense effectively. And we'll see the quarterback situation is a, a consideration. We'll talk to Coach Munkin on Thursday and see if he's – able to share any more information than he did today about uh, about who's likely to play at uh, quarterback. Also, no word, I asked him about Connor Bishop, and he was not uh, forthcoming with anything on Connor's uh, status. Hopefully, he's uh, back uh, ready to play soon. Okay, any, any final thoughts from the group? I, I, I do, Ken. We cannot, we cannot go away without just recognizing – Last Saturday's college football game schedule. Good here, Lord. here. Yes. How Not good was you? Oh, yes. How good was watching college football last weekend? If if the awesome. name, image, and likeness in the transfer portal is going to oh. give us this, then I like it because I was watching Notre Dame, which I predicted was going to lose to Virginia Tech, and they were about to lose. I was watching uh, Alabama game. That was awesome. Uh, you know, I was switching for channel to channel to channel, and I was watching the Air Force game, and they are a beast, by the way. Air Force is an absolute beast, and they're going to be tough. We're going to have to play every down, and we're going to have to bring it. And then to watch Navy come out and play as well as they did, we cannot sleep on Navy either. They are slowly but surely bringing themselves back to regular Navy football. Graphic. But then to watch all the other games and how they played out and it was a ton of fun this weekend to watch college football. I don't know if you agree, but man, it was good. Yes, it was. Yes. Yeah, the Red River rivalry uh, game, the, absolutely a phenomenal. You had Ole Miss and uh, uh, Arkansas, which yeah. was 51-52. Um, 
And then the, the yeah. game of games uh, of, of the day, and, and by the way, the state of Alabama is in mourning because you had both Alabama and Auburn lost mm. on Saturday. And I don't know when the last time that happened. So there's a lot of long faces here in Alabama, but hand it to Texas A&M because just when it looked like they were going to fold like a cheap suit, by golly, they reached deep down inside and found what it is they needed to pull that game out and hand it to that quarterback Good Lord. on that last drive. When he saw that man-to-man, he saw that man-on-man coverage and threw that deep pass when he did to create that uh, pass interference play that almost guaranteed the field goal was going to be good, man, talk about a heads-up play. Uh, and uh, so in the, the Notre Dame game, I mean, Notre Dame was down to like 29-21, I believe, but managed to come back and win the game. The Wake Forest Syracuse game was was, was just a, a, any pick your pick your poison this past Saturday. It might have been the single best Saturday of games you could have did it practically any game you turned on was great. Even the Georgia Tech Duke game, if you could find it, was a great game. So, yes, Steve is right. And uh, Navy, yes, they're finding a little bit of mojo. They're finding their scrappiness. They're, very, they're playing very desperate, and they're making teams make mistakes out of their own desperation. And it looked like the game against uh, SMU was going to be a repeat of the UCF game. That's what it was, was shaping up to be. Um, unfortunately for Navy, uh, uh, a combination of SMU adjustments and Navy shooting themselves in the foot in the second half ultimately led to their demise. But yeah, Navy, uh, any uh, rumor to the death of Navy football was unfounded. Um, they're still there, and they're, I guarantee you, come December 12th, um, they're, they're going to come ready to play. Mm. So, um, but yeah, what, what a day, what a day for college yep. football. Yep. Very good. Very good. Um, and, uh, should be another big weekend of uh, college football, Richard, any game you're going to be keeping your eye on before we get to army. Um, and Wisconsin? As, as far as, as far as the games, I'm going to keep going to be keeping my game. I, I on the, this week. Let's see. The game I'm going to be keeping my my eye on is actually this Saturday, Kentucky and Georgia, three thirty. Okay, okay, that should be a good one. Uh, Kentucky revive program. Are they still undefeated? Yes, Kentucky is undefeated. Yes, and Kentucky. remember, uh, last week I I I picked Kentucky to beat LSU. They beat LSU handily. Um, but uh, something you don't see in the headline is that Kentucky lost two of their defensive tackles in the game. One of them's out for the season. Yeah. And uh, one another thing that I mentioned last week is uh, Kentucky, enjoy it while it lasts because you're in the same conference as Georgia and Alabama. And uh, now you're going to play what is probably the best defense in college football, not only this year, but maybe the best defense we've seen in college football in a while. And that is the defense of the Georgia Bulldogs, and it's being played between the hedges. So, uh, yeah, I, I I see Georgia winning this one by about three or four touchdowns. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Let's wrap up. I always want to uh, recognize the two million veterans of the American Legion and the three hundred thirty thousand members of the Sons of the American Legion, uh, our organization serving America's veterans. I was at a meeting of our state organization uh, this week uh, under the leadership this year of uh, David Lee uh, from the Binghamton area is doing a great job uh, leading our organization here in uh, New York. Okay, so that will wrap it up. Uh, follow our cover coverage uh, uh, from Madison, Wisconsin on Saturday. Uh, we'll be at the Society of West Point for Wisconsin's tailgate before the game and uh, Plenty of pregame coverage, and uh, we'll uh, watch that uh, big marching band from uh, Wisconsin, uh, which should be quite interesting. And then a, a very competitive football game with 90,000 people expected at Camp Randall Stadium. So thank everybody. Richard Miller, thank you from Florida. You're welcome, Ken. And Jack McGurk from Pelham, good job. Thank you.
And Sam Houston, class of 87 from the Beat Navy studio in Huntsville, Alabama. Go Army, beat the Badgers. Okay, and Steve Shalou from South Jersey. Thank you for joining us in your insight. Beat them. Okay, so again, uh, we'll be out at Madison, uh, Wisconsin on Saturday for coverage. Go to our page, West Point Football Report right here, and also on Twitter at Suns Legion Radio. So it's Ken Kratzer from White Plains, New York. Have a great night.